Thank you so much for joining us, Mike and John. Uh, the title is a long title, but it's a good title. Money, Ma I like Money Matters, Broad Divisia Money and the Recovery of Nominal GDP from the COVID-19 Recession. So, Michael, a great new fact. I, you're going to start us off. Is that yeah, I'm going to start us off. Okay. And we, we'd like to have a few minutes uh, to get no into questions. this without any questions. No questions until you say it's okay. How many? Okay. How many? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, no questions. I have an interest in this. So. <laughs> yeah. We'll open it up. No, no, no. No, because I, 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 it's from long experience here. That's why I'm doing this. Um, so it's, it's great to be back. Uh, uh, this is a, a paper with, with John Duca. We've been working on this a long time. Um, and it's, it seems to be pretty timely because now we are in a situation of inflation, which is coming down. And, okay, click. Oh, which one? This one? Oh. Okay. So, um, and there was some issue about what, what were the causes of inflation, but it seems like uh, the fact that uh, that we had this high nominal GDP growth in 2021, along with inflation going above 20%, suggests that it was a a good a good chunk of it was excess demand and not so much the supply shocks. Um, and so, and this just just again just shows that uh, that nominal GDP is, has been rising way above its its uh, its trends and suggests that inflation is is a, a good uh, aggregate demand, excess demand story. And so the, the traditional Chicago view, and I'm still one of the relics left from that time, uh, which is the quantity theory of money was that if you have, if, if velocity is stable in the long run, <clears throat> that too much money growth is eventually going to fuel high inflation. So this is a very old story. Uh, and in a sense, this paper does fit into that 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 tradition and uh and what we do is we look at we look at broad divisia money and we'll talk about we'll explain what we mean by divisia but there is this long-term you know relationship between money and and nominal gdp growth and so this is this this picture kind of shows you uh that pattern but one of the issues that's been around for many decades now is that you know looking at taking a, a a quantity theory monetarist approach has really was not that successful in the past because of the fact that the demand for money for simple sum monetary aggregates like M2 really didn't work out too well. There were there was there was unpredictability in the 1970s and 80s. And so central banks have moved away from using them. And and what what's sort of interesting now is that you know what happened comparing the recent episode of the last three years with what happened after the, the global financial crisis is that we did get, we had rapid money growth and we had inflation. And so we want to get at this question of like, well, if you look at the right measures, or if you look at, at, at reasonable measures of money and of, of velocity, you might be able to show how money had a lot to do with the inflation that we've had. And so this, this shows you what one reason why people have not focused on money. This is simple sum M2 velocity, which has been pretty unstable uh, in the period going back about 50, 40 or 50 years. Um, but there's been a lot of work out there for decades by Barnett and others that talked about using divisio money. And we'll explain in detail what that means, that it tends to work better than the simple sum M, the simple sum monetary aggregates. So what we do in this paper is we, we improve upon short run and long run models of the demand for, or the velocity of divisia M3. And we find that, that doing it this way, we actually do get the stability, which might have evaded us in, in previous decades, which says that if, if velocity is stable, that maybe looking at money can help, can help us a lot in explaining the growth in nominal GDP and inflation. And so this, this is the, the picture we have. So the V3 divisia, John's gonna explain how we got that, but that, that does a, a much better job, I think of, uh, is much more stable than the simple sum 
uh, V2. Just clarification. Yeah. How do you, what is the velocity of money? How is it computed? Okay, it's defined as, as nominal GDP divided by a, a monetary aggregate. Okay. Okay. So also, um, uh, during the, the global financial crisis, uh, velocity of V3 um, fell quite a bit because what happened was that the uncertainty associated with the crisis raised the demand for money. Then it recovered. So there's a snapback, velocity fell, then it came back. Same story happened in the pandemic. And so that the fact that you know, you don't always get this really perfect correlation or even very close between M and, and P or Y is because the velocity is, 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 uh, is changing. And so this picture here shows you what happened. So this is the, the velocity function that we're gonna look at. And you can see these two big drops that happened during the global financial crisis. And then uh, during the, the, just coming out of the recent um, oh, the recent uh, COVID experience, okay? And so what's happened in the last two years is the Fed did shift to an anti-inflationary policy. Um, as we've argued at, at, here at Hoover, they were behind the curve by at least six months, but they've caught up and they did start doing tight, tighter monetary policy. And this slowed Divisia M3 growth from being very rapid to being slightly negative. At the same time, you got velocity, which, which declined during the pandemic, and that is now coming back. And so in a sense, when you interact the behavior of velocity with money, you can explain why it takes a while for these changes in monetary policy to show up in prices and nominal GDP because of what Friedman talked about in the old days. Yeah. Yeah. So you've left out a key fact. We've, we've talked about this many times before, the, but it's really important now, and that is the, the interest on Fed pays interest on, on reserves. So that has that has an absolutely first order effect in this analysis. And, yes, and and that is and that's part of the story of why we did not get inflation after the GFC because of that. And what's happened now is that, in a sense, the amount of money that they that they've been issuing is a lot greater so it's a there's a different story and we also john will talk further about what happened that's what's what's happening today from what happened you know 15 years ago and so what what and we're going to explain this we're, we're going to explain this as we go along and so the main point we're trying to make here is is to say that if you if you if you can measure velocity, the demand for money, if you can measure it to account for lots of factors that are at work, institutional changes, that having, looking at the Vizia M3 can be useful as an information variable for forecasting nominal GDP. So we're not coming out with a, in a sense, a, a pitch for going back to, you know, simple, you know, just follow tight money and then you'll get low inflation, just follow money. We're saying that looking at at the monetary aggregates is something worth taking. It's it's worth looking at again, John. Yeah. To the, first of all, reserves are not the busy M three, and that's very important. Yeah. I hope you will tell us how the Fed actually controlled the busy M three, because my impression was the Fed doesn't control monetary aggregates at all. There's no reserve requirements. There's no right. nothing. They just set an interest rate. And your last comment is very important because it leads goes from the correlation to causation question. The busy M3, may, people may demand more of it when inflation goes up, and they may demand post hoc ergo proctor hoc. Right. They may demand more of it ahead of time. That doesn't mean that right. it is the cause of the inflation. Right. So I hope you're going to get to, if you think it's the Fed's actions that slow M3 and that makes inflation go down, I hope you'll get to just how the Fed does that. Okay. Well, well, we we you will answer those. Now. You know, we will we will answer those questions. Um, and in a sense, we're, we're taking a fairly conservative position here. We're not saying go back to money. We're saying money, if you measure, probably can be useful. We're just saying, wait, wait. Money caused inflation. <laughs> money is useful for forecasting inflation. Okay. Well, that, and and that conditional on everything else we know, it adds branch yeah. power. Right. That's another issue. Yeah. So, no, right. we're we're aware of that. Enforce your rule. Right. <laughs> so this is really 
my motivation and what we're going to do. I'll let all I can turn this over to John uh, and he's going to do the heavy lifting. Um, Thank you, Mike. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Of course, the typical Fed disclaimer applies. I'm going to first talk a little bit about how, how you measure money with Divisio and then interpret our results from an ISMP perspective with the Fed targeting rates and uh, trying to figure out what, where the IS curve is during, uh, uh, during the pandemic. And then I'm going to talk about the results from modeling velocity. Uh, there are different COVID scenarios for the recovery of velocity. As Mike mentioned before, velocity typically falls during crises and then comes back. And talk about some of the implications for nominal GDP paths going forward, and then I'll conclude. So let's first start off. We're all used to looking at simple sum monetary aggregates where we just add up the components. We put, a, put the unitary weight on each component. Divisia is uh, something that uh, Bill Barnett and, and, and some of his co-authors have, have pushed, uh, takes a different view. Uh, looks at measuring money, uh, treats the price of monetary services as the differential between the interest rate on a risk-free asset that does not provide services, financial liquidity services, and that on, and the interest rate on uh, a monetary component. And the idea is that one pays implicitly for monetary services by giving up this opportunity cost or user cost. And the growth rate of a Divisia index equals the weighted average of the growth rate of components and each of the weights. So you can think about demand deposits, small time deposits, the like, uh, as an, what's called an average expenditure share. So you think about the expenditure that people spend on, let's say owning a demand deposit is equal to the user cost on that demand deposit times the amount of demand deposit balances. You add that all up with a, in a Torquest tile sort of index or your aggregate rather, and you come up with an overall measure, okay? And as a result, growth in higher interest bearing money components gets less weight because it has lower, lower opportunity costs and less implicit monetary services. Um, simple sum aggregates don't do that. And we focus on using uh, measures from the Center for Financial Stability, CFS in New York. Uh, they're, we're gonna focus mainly on Divisia M3, uh, which uh, the creation was ultimately uh, inspired by Barnett's work, uh, but uh, a lot of the practical uh, measurement was actually done by uh, Dick Anderson and Barry Jones when they were at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And uh, what Divisia M2 does, for example, is it aggregates the services from M2 balances. Divisia M3 adds services from large time deposits, repos, and institutional money market funds. And this internalizes a lot of shadow, what we call shadow bank money. If you go back to the, the days of the subprime boom, we saw large rises in institutional money market funds. These are the funds that are that are owned by you know, big financial institutions. Um, and um, they bought a lot of short-term debt from some of the investment banks that were investing in subprime asset, subprime mortgage assets, as well as commercial real estate. Um, and of course that expands and collapses. And one of the nice things about lose, using Divisia M3 is you're gonna capture that relative rise and fall. And that, that, that's really important. I have a gen genuine sure. clarifying question. Sure. I'm allowed, I hope. What's the reference interest rate that is the risk-free rate with no financial services? Right, well, um, what CFS does from what Barry Jones and I can um, figure is they use a, a commercial and industrial loan rate, uh, a prime rate, a, 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 I think a high, a prime a prime type rate. It's, it's, it's a little difficult to find. You can't necessarily use a treasury because... One can argue that treasuries can be. Well, this was going to be my next yeah. question. Daryl and I just came from the finance workshop where it's bandied about the treasuries themselves have two to 6% uh, liquidity. Yeah. In the and so th this is a great question because Divisia M3, M, M4 plus looks at the serve adds in the services from treasuries 
as well as commercial paper. Divisia M4 minus adds the services from commercial paper. Instead of you, you know, overnight yeah. repo as the reference rate, then pretty much everybody has within 10 basis points. I may be exaggerating overnight repo. It's not going to make any difference. You're going to be back to just cash. Whereas if you take like 6% as your baseline rate, then you're just <clears throat> a huge amount of money stuff that all is paying, you know, two or 3% less than. Uh, right. Than but that. the thing is, well, the, it's the relative movements over time that are going to be uh, when you aggregate up, it's going to help. Um, the big movement over time has been just a flip flop in the fraction of credit extended by financial institutions. Back in the 90s, it was 70 percent of credit extended. Now it's 30 percent. Right. And but they also they also hold a lot of mortgage backed securities and but a huge, it's a huge yeah. secular change that's occurred. Gradually and continually, maybe it's an asymptote. Who knows? But uh, I know you're paying a lot of attention to shorter-term, higher-frequency movements. But no. it's against that big backdrop. It's worth noting. Yeah, and I think uh, we see a lot of, you know, a lot of loans are sec securitized and marketed that way and priced that way. I, I, I take your point. Agency debt. All of this stuff is going to be part of. Yeah, and you can use, you know, the, our models work well for Divisia M3, Divisia M4 minus, Divisia 4M plus. Model works a little bit better for Divisia M3 when I look at when I try to model velocity. Now, uh, I should move on in the interest of time, and we can come back to some of these issues. And thank you for your interest. So, broad Divisia money, velocity falls in crisis, but later recovers. And if you think, if you recall, in, in a monitor's view, well, semi pseudo monitors view aggregate demand is money times velocity so velocity if you move money and then velocity goes down but then later recovers it's going to impart long and variable legs to use milton friedman's old uh, and, and anna schwartz's view on the effects of swings associated with money growth so let's um i want to most 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 of the younger folks are uh, more interested you know we're familiar with an ismp perspective and so when the Fed pegs interest rates, uh, money will grow faster if the IS curve shifts to the right. Um, but in crises, you can have shifts going all over the place. So for example, if we go back to the Great Recession, uh, we had credit frictions from loan losses, uncertainty, tougher bank regulation, Dodd-Frank was, was, was on its way, people kind of knew that. All this helped restrain the creation of money and credit. If you look at uh, Divisia M3 growth in the Great Recession, you see it falling quite a bit. This is largely due to the collapse of the uh, institutional money funds and large time deposits that are going on at this time. Now, if you think about, if we go back, uh, uh, talk about what happened in the pandemic, obviously the peanut butter hit the fan when the pandemic started, but loan losses, and uncertainty were limited. We had stronger regulation going into the crisis, so the bankers were in better shape. We had Fed support for co corporate bond finance, and we had a lot of fiscal support to firms. PPP loans were guaranteed by the Treasury. Uh, households had lots of fiscal transfers. And from our perspective, the reserve injections from quantitative easing and just general money growth were money based growth were able to greatly boost money creation. If you look, if you look here, you see, and I'll be with you in a second, John, you see much more rapid money growth here in the COVID period than you do during the Great Recession. We had roughly the same amount of QE for 4 trillion. We had the funds rate being slammed down to zero. In fact, the funds rate cuts were smaller in this episode, but you had more rapid money growth. Now, of course, when you're targeting an interest rate, you are basic, you're making money endogenous. And so what we're arguing is essentially that this is picking up some information. Yes. So reserves pay the same interest as treasury. So I don't see why a QE would make any difference at all to Divisia M3. And also if M3 goes down, what goes up? Or is it just a price effect? I mean, do, do we get rid of money and we buy something else, or is it just for the interest rate? Well, you you could also you could also um, 
You can also, well, you can also remember that if you look at Divisia M4, Divisia M4, those things are going to be pretty similarly. Okay. No, this isn't about one version of that. This is just basic conceptual questions. So, yeah. you know, wait, you see M3 going down. Right. Does that mean something else went up? People exchanged money for some other? Well, so, well to some extent, well, services change. I hear you. Um, in a world where bankers really aren't subject to reserve requirements, right? There is going to be, to, to a large extent, a lot of what money creation is going to be is, is there's a lot of endogeneity here, okay? And in that environment, they're not gonna create, their, for example, large time deposits plunged during uh, this period. They're not going to issue a lot of managed liabilities to fund credit expansion, okay? Here, there, you know, that's that's not occurring, okay? Um, and so the environment's different, the, mu the money multiplier in a certain sense is a lot different. And we think that there's information, uh, let, let me move on a little bit from the interest of time. Uh, one thing is if the Fed is largely, tar if the lar Fed is stabilizing nominal GDP growth over a long period of time. So take this uh, period from like 93 to 2019. It includes, this roughly this period is a pre-inflation -tar targeting period where inflation was roughly stabilized around 2%. And then we had the for more formal target in here. Well, if you look at, if the Fed is ultimately stabilizing nominal GDP growth over this period, then and velocity were roughly constant, then average money growth would be roughly in line with nominal GDP growth. And in fact, that's the case. If you interpret stabilizing nominal GDP as uh, sort of Taylor Rule-esque type behavior, then uh, money growth comes out endogenously and you don't get any, uh, it, the signals would, would roughly not uh, cause you uh, concern. But when you move to a period where let's say you're conducting a lot of unconventional monetary policy, um, it becomes very difficult to know where that IS curve is and what, what's going on. Um, now, uh, let me move on to modeling velocity. And then I'll talk about COVID scenarios and then uh, the implications for uh, nominal GDP. So in principle, if you had all the assets in the world and you created the Vizia index, um, its velocity shouldn't move much. But the fact of the matter is, practically speaking, there are gonna be assets outside of the money components that you're tracking the services from, okay? And, but at the same time, we know the liquidity of all competing assets, particularly stock mutual funds, which is an alternative for households to small time deposits, that has changed. And in fact, uh, mutual fund costs, uh, particular loads, seem to have made a big difference. We've had a big decline in mutual fund costs, particularly in the 90s, that caused some very big declines in small time deposits. It caused a decline in money demand because velocity is adversely related to money demand. That's going to push up the velocity of money. But we also saw some derivatives rules. Uh, I've done some work in the bond market. And um, basically, and Tim Bolton has, has, has argued this as well, uh, there's derivatives uh, legislation in the early, about 2000, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, that basically made it very hard to decipher the risk of companies. For example, uh, their derivative positions. And why does that matter? What CFMA did was it made uh, derivatives contracts enforceable in a court of law. Before that, it was, it was very unclear. As soon as they passed that um, credit default swap, swaps soared, I mean, literally soared and took off and uh, provided a lot of the backing, particularly for sub, subprime and commercial real estate uh, stuff that got us into trouble later on. But viewing it from an investor's point of view, what this act did was it made derivatives contracts get a bankruptcy priority before the bondholders and even the bank loans. So uh, the derivatives contracts get paid before the widowers and the widow widows uh, get their bond payments in case of a bankruptcy. Um, and you see some upward movement in bond spreads around that time as well that, that seems to be long lasting. 
Now, the other thing that affects velocity, and let me, uh, so if we look at the velocity of V3, uh, sorry, rather the velocity of, of the Vizy M3, there's a period of rising velocity. This is a period of falling mutual fund loads that causes people to switch from small time deposits, which are trivial now, they were big back then, they're trivial now, into stock mutual funds. Then later followed by the passage of CFMA and you see people get shying away from these assets. Remember Enron, Enron scandal, but also um, <clears throat> just it's just tougher to, 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 to figure these things out. Now let me move back. Now, oops, sorry about that. So the other thing that also happened was COVID, obviously, right? So think about what happens during, during restrictions. You can't go out, you can't spend. You can't spend, you build up excess savings. A lot of those savings take the form of excess money balances. You get your stimulus check, you can't go out on a cruise, you put it in the, you put it in the bank account. And um, then later on, um, the restrictions get eased some, people get vaccinated. And so what we try to do is try to control for that. We proxy for it. Now there's no perfect proxy by interacting the Oxford uh, Blavatnik Center's index of government restrictions on, on behavior times one minus the share of fully vaccinated. I, I think when, you know, most of us felt like we could do a lot more once we got our second uh, vaccination shot, and waited a week or so. Um, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna model long run velocity of divisia, broad divisia aggregates as a negative function of mutual fund loads, a negative function of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act era, and a negative function of these, of this COVID vaccination slash um, government restrictions index. So if we look, uh, let me show you what the mutual fund, some of the mutual funds data, data going back a long time. The solid line is the is an inverted scale that's on this axis. This is the average uh, load or percentage fee you pay for investing in a in a stock a large stock mutual fund. Okay, it used to be about eight percent in the early '60s, and it rose, it fell. Uh, remember, this is inverted to around two percent or so. Um, but most of that decline occurred in here. The bars are the percentage of Americans, and that's on this axis, that own stocks with the lighted, the light colored bar, part of the bar is indicating the share of households that own stocks only through mutual funds. Okay, the solid bar, the share that own directly. Um, the co these things have a, these things are negatively correlated with a coefficient of about minus one. How do, you, how do you come up with two percent recently? Well, this is these are smaller size non-admiral type funds. Half of this is indexed. <laughs> a lot of it is indexed, right? Right, but there are still quite a few mutual funds that charge loads. Average charging nine basis points. Yeah. Sort of if you get two percent as an average. Well, um, if you, but I'm also trying to look at the median household here because most of these most of these assets are. Your, your point is well taken. So we're not including, for example, a Vanguard Admiral funds that have high, high balances. You're not including anyone at this table. <laughs> including me, yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Let me move on. Uh, uh, we already talked about the, uh, talked about the uh, Commodity Futures Modernization Act, but, but we also have to deal with these short run effects, these crisis effects. So we have, in the short run model, we include movements in the BAA treasury, long term treasury rate to try to help control for some flights to quality. But we have to put in something to control for COVID. And so this is a this is a plot of the velocity of the Vizia M3. It plunges. That's the black. That's the purple line. Okay. And here we have the the Oxford Government Stringency Index. Uh, and um, we, in our model, we actually multiply this by one minus the, the fully vaccinated uh, share for the, for the COVID period. It seems to track the, the um, 
through the temporary effects. So we have a long run model. So this is the long run model of velocity. We have a short run model where we're looking at the changes. It's an error correction framework. The error correction term is the log of actual velocity minus what we think the equilibrium, the estimated equilibrium. That coefficient beta one should be negative so that changes in velocity move to close the gap between actual and equilibrium. And uh, our samples span the, the era of the, the deregulated deposits. Okay. We go up through COVID. We also go, uh, go up to the beginning of the pandemic. We also include the pandemic. Um, key money demand results. We, we get unique and significant co-integrating co relationships pre and post COVID. By the way, if we estimate the model through like 2005 or so, we get, we get pretty much the same results, same coefficients. Looks like it's stable in the long run. Uh, the coefficient signs all, all are expected. Velocity is de decreasing in mutual fund loads of uh, the Commodity Future Modernization Act and the COVID variable. There's a four quarter lead of the estimated equilibrium that lines up with actual velocity. Uh, let me just show you that. So that lines up pretty well. Of course, you're gonna have some temporary effects here, but we're moving back. Uh, the more recent estimates are somewhere kind of converging towards where my, the green line is. Seems like we're gonna go somewhere over here. Let me move back a second. The short run models perform well. Uh, the model fits are clean, uh, have, have good, are good, and we get clean residuals. Um, but then we have to create some, some scenarios because we don't know how people are going to react to COVID in the long run. Now, some people will prefer to wear masks for a long time and socially distance. Others, others won't. Um, so what we do is we estimate some, we convert the models into autoregressive distributed lag equivalents, which are easier to use. And we come up with some scenarios for recoveries in, in velocity. Um, let me talk about that a little bit. So um, the government stringency index peaked at 72 when the, when the pandemic really hit us in the second quarter of 2020. It's fallen to 27 by the end of the first quarter. It's probably fallen further. I'm trying to get them to give us some more up-to-date estimates. Uh, vaccinations are plateauing near 69% or so. We keep it pretty much there. What we do is we come up with a high, a low, medium, and optimistic a recovery. Uh, the optimistic basically says we're back to normal in 24 uh, Q2. Um, medium, well, we're going to be somewhat below uh, permanently. Low, we're going to be even lower. We don't know. We don't know how people are going to behave in the long run. I probably fall more towards these two. Let me show you a little bit about what restrictions that are still in place in 2023. Yes, there are in terms of. So they would be things like uh, restrictions on how many people you can pack into a restaurant. So it includes some of the local restrictions. No, these are these are great questions. They're relatively mild. I, te I tend to like I tend to like the high the high scenario. So it's going on. I'll be with you in just a sec. So here's the actual, and we come up with some, we use our coefficient, in-sample coefficients, and we say, well, we don't know exactly how, but this is a range, okay? And, and, and you can see the high, we're coming back to normal. Uh, yes, John. I, I do want to object a little to the cause of language. You're okay. Velocity is fixed exogenously by things, including how many vaccines are going on, and the more M you put in, the more PY. The other, but then you actually told the story. Why did velocity actually go up when people, I mean, transaction demand for money goes down when you can't spend it. Well, you said we sent them a lot of checks and they just left it in their bank accounts. Well, that's a view that velocity is completely endogenous. So you just send people checks. They don't do much with them. They're not on a money demand curve. They're not really thinking <clears> about <throat> saving. Or you just, you know, spend it down. Well, they've been up. They've been up. He, it's not. It's V equals uh, PY over M, whatever PY is gonna be, whatever M happens to be, that's what determines V. And you actually told that story. <laughs> well, think about, well. That was an objection, not a question. But. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, okay. Uh, 
it, think about World War II. We had we had we had serious rationing. We had very strong money growth. We had price controls. After the war, we lift lift the price controls. People can go back to spending. We had a huge bout of inflation, and uh, some of the, and in a certain sense, the government restrictions and the fear that people had, uh, they waited, um, and. And they couldn't buy non-monetary assets either. Well, uh, well, if you will, is that why do people sitting on checking accounts not say, well, this is kind of dumb. I'll buy stocks with it. And try to get well, but, but at the same time, interest rates are very low. And yeah, exactly. and people were a little worried about, yeah. Well, then money is, money is a perfect substitute for everything else. We're out of business. I wouldn't say it's a perfect substitute, but I think there's, well, I, I'm taking the view, we're taking the view that there's some, some information here. Let me... Uh, so if we take these velocity um, paths, we're gonna, let's just do some scenarios with different growth rates of Divisium M3 going forward, okay? Um, wait, whoops, sorry. We have a modest path. Um, actually, Divisium M3 was contracting nominally at about a 4% annual rate in, uh, in the early part of 2023, first, first actually fourth quarter of 2022 to the second quarter of 2023. Um, we're assuming that it fell, that we wrote this paper uh, a few months ago, we assume that it fell further, uh, then it flattens out and then it grows 4% magically from 2024 uh, Q1 on. This is the idea, this would, you might interpret this as a sudden reversal uh, in the expansion of the money supply, either due to banking, uh, the bankers' attitudes sort of towards creating uh, liabilities in order to fund asset growth, or what the Fed may be doing. Uh, the slow path, here we are assuming that um, money growth just rebounds to a very sluggish pace in 2024, 4% thereafter, you could interpret this, some people may interpret this as uh, the Fed easing off, let's say in 2024, at some point. Uh, partial retrenchment, this is um, very, very tight policy uh, or tight bank money creation, uh, zero growth in 2024, 4% after. 4% after if you, our model assumes that velocity is stable in the long run. 4% nominal GDP, roughly 2% inflation, roughly 2% growth. And let me just show you what the scenarios look like. Yeah, good. Let me, I think I can state it more clearly. Yeah. Suppose in the pandemic, rather than sending people checks, which counted as Divisi M3, the government had said, we're gonna send you all uh, mutual funds that hold treasuries. It didn't count as Divisi M3. Your prediction, you'd say, well, velocity is collapsing, so we're going to have massive deflation because we didn't send people the thing they wanted. Where I would say, well, they're just going to sit on those mutual funds exactly the same way they sat on the uh, they sat on the money. But they, but they did, but they did. And I, I think look at it this way: uh, if but, you want, if you yeah, want to get a Slurpee at Seven Eleven, you don't show up and pay pay the cashier with a ten thousand dollar treasury bill. They wouldn't even know what it is. Oh, you, okay. When you want to buy something, yeah. your, your question is this massive amount of assets just sat there. When you want to buy something, you sell it and, and you buy something and you hold them. Well, what, would you, what would you do? Would you hold zero? You could hold zero percent interest earning treasuries or, or treasury bills or zero percent you know, earning uh, uh, bank point. deposits that can actually do something in case you need to run to the hills. My point exactly. If yeah. the government had sent them money market funds, uh, easily to easily sellable money market funds that own treasuries that weren't cash. If you think velocity is doing what it's doing, and that's the exogenous thing, you well, predict then there would be big deflation. Okay, my, my comeback to you, uh, we'll have to get back to the presentation, but the, my comeback to you is we've also estimated the Vizia M4, which includes the services from treasuries. So let me, uh, let me move on. Let me show you some of these. So this is a, this is a, this is a plot of nominal GDP growth using the using the velocity scenarios with what we call the modest Divisia M3 growth scenario, where Divisia just grows back to four percent, starts growing at four percent first quarter. What's going on here? Well, you'll notice this period here. We had high 
high divisia, high, high nominal GDP growth. This is a period where money growth is slowing down, but velocity is going up because it's recovering. So you have to take into account both. If you look in the look in late yeah. 2024, 2023, you see a slowdown in nominal GDP growth towards 4%, uh, depending on the scenario. Okay. This, this is reflecting the combination of very, uh, the lagged effects of money growth turning negative in late 2022, first half of 2023, being weak in the, in the fourth quarter, velocity still recovering some, then as money growth recovers, and velocity still recovering, you get a temporary pickup, and then you converge towards 4%. Well, if you've extended this further out, it would go towards 4%. Another scenario, which some people may think is more plausible, is the slow growth scenario. That is, money growth slows to 2% in Q4 in 2024, and then reverts back to 20 to 4% in 2020. Uh, 25, 26. And what this suggests is if we look at the more optimistic scenarios for velocity that, that Steve and I, I tend to prefer, uh, we get a return to about 4% nominal GDP growth in 2025. Okay? So this is kind of in line with the idea that inflation will probably get back towards normal somewhere around here. Okay? We may have a slowdown, we may have a growth recession. Uh, hopefully not a recession in here to get there. That's not that uh, that not that far from what we're seeing. And um, I'm going to skip this scenario. I don't think this is a scenario where uh, money growth is very very tight, and then we're going to see consistently below four percent nominal GDP growth. Uh, that's that's a tough that's a tough slog for the economy. Let me let me let me go to the conclusion, and we can open it up a, a lot more. So we think that. A lot of the recent inflation, not all of it, but a lot of it was funded by, fueled by expansionary fiscal and monetary policies. And the simple quantity theory of ex, uh, explanation, too much money chasing too few goods, which have been discredited in, in the past, uh, was, was done so because simple sum aggregates were failing us. And I think that that's pretty, pretty darn clear. We argue that there is some information in Divisia M's because you can model as velocity, and, and that can help you track the path of nominal GDP if you take into account that velocity falls during crises, there are going to be delayed effects. doesn't mean you don't flood the system with funds during a crisis, you do, but maybe you have to be careful about how much you do and when you, when you start to reverse that. The lagged adjustment of, of velocity to uncertainty shocks helps explain the sluggish response of nominal GDP to slowing down and to inflation to these, to, to the, um, to what we've seen. Uh, and it suggests also that the, the, the impact of recent Fed tightening since, since uh, let's say you're sometime in 2022, depending on how you interpret Fed tightening, uh, will be drawn out. And we think that summarily ignoring uh, money is not, there's some information there. And we should perhaps look look more carefully at the Divisia aggregates. And I would never focus on any one aggregate, but I would, one of the things that uh, Mike and I are going to probably do with Barry, Barry Jones is look at um, seeing if Divisia M3 growth, real Divisia M3 growth adds something uh, to, let's say, an index of leading economic indicators. Um, and thank you, and let me, let, let's open it up. Yes. I, I wanna go to the, what's related to John's question, mm -hmm. to the meaning of these uh, Divisia services. So suppose I'm a corporate depositor and uh, Fed funds is five and a quarter and I'm getting 50 basis points realistically, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a ripoff. Your story is I'm getting 475 basis points of services uh, for uh, holding my deposits at 50 basis points. If deposit market competition picks up as it has 
the 50 goes to, let's say, 200 maybe. Mm -hmm. The fact that the rent that's taken by the banks from me through deposit market competition hasn't probably really changed the amount of services I'm getting from the <coughs> deposit. If I understand that, yeah. you know, my trade off is now tighter and, uh, you know, uh, I get that. But if, if that gap goes in half, does it really mean that? The amount of services that I got goes in half. Isn't there a nonlinear effect here where I'm not really losing half of my services when competition pushes up the deposit rate halfway to the wholesale rate? Well, I would look at it this way. If you're holding, if you're holding these assets with very wide opportunity costs and you're a decent corporate treasurer, you better be getting some liquidity services from doing it. And you no, would I object. Agree, agree. And I think it, at an equilibrium, that's... You know, pe people will adjust. It takes, takes a while. And we do have some some lagged adjustment. Yeah, here. my point is nonlinearity. Is it really true that I'm losing a lot of services uh, gradually over time as uh, that gap starts to narrow through increased deposit companies? I think for most, I th think for what, what we're looking at with these with a lot of these aggregates is look at the components, the big the big share of the components. You're going to have some very liquid assets that do not pay much of anything at all. But you're going to have a lot of money funds that pay near market interest rates. You're going to have a lot of large time deposits that pay near near, near market interest rates. Um, an enormous amount of transaction deposits earning almost nothing. Right. Millions and trillions of dollars. Yeah. Um, I've looked at the numbers. Is that, a, is that a U.S. only phenomenon or would that be true in other large economies as well. I actually asked somebody in Brazil uh, about increased deposit market competition, how it's affecting interest rates. He said, oh, we actually in Brazil, we don't we don't allow our banks to pay interest on deposits. So I guess, uh, you know, it's probably not unusual around the world. Okay. I mean, it, does, it does highlight that a lot of movements in what, when you do a divisia and three, a lot of the movement in the quantity of money is not going to be about the change in the number of dollar bills. It's going to be a change in the interest rate and exactly. therefore the imputed moneyness of those dollar bills. That's my point. I mean, I, I get that this trade off is being made, but I don't get that it's linear in this gap. Uh, it doesn't it's seem like time invariant. Yeah. It seems like it. Oh, it, it is. Yeah, it, do, it does assume that the, you know, the approximation does assume that it is proportional to the user cost. And in that sense, you're right. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why when you get into these crises, you see some of this unusual behavior. There's something else going on. Uh, yes. So Larry Meyer has a Larry. Do you have a question? Okay. First of all, this was a really interesting paper, and you get an A plus for effort. That was just a lot of work. Um, <laughs> secondly, that's another part. The minor point, <laughs> I don't believe that the story was about demand. It was mainly about supply. The board staff, FOMC participants agree it's becoming more of a consensus. It's my point. Now, I think that uh, what I liked about the paper was you didn't overstate your results. You didn't try to uh, project them as relevant to all of history, but you focused on this narrow period. Now, I want to tell you what would convince me on this on a more longer period, and that is. Uh, I don't want to have you take back my PhD, but in the second chapter, Does Money Matter? I did it this way. Do you think these divisia indices would come in to aggregate demand equations? You, you must, if you really believe this story. Did you try? Okay, I did for all kinds of monetary aggregates. I let interest rates and cost of capital have the first opportunity, as theory would suggest, and then I asked if any of the different measures, not the issue, uh, mattered, and they didn't. So I would be impressed, uh, and I don't know that we're really far, far apart here, but I would be impressed if you looked at that and told me, look at the COVID period, so strange, I, I have no particular views. I, I think it's an excellent point, uh, Larry, and thank you for making it. Uh, this is part of the reason why uh, we want to tr we want to see how much does this add, let's say, to how much does some sort of uh, velocity adjusted divisia uh, aggregate, let's say, add to let's say the leading index. Um, 
By the way, the conference board ditched including real M2 growth, real M2 in, in, as one of its components of the index of leading indicators uh, because it had serious problems with velocity and it was actually messing things up. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things I, this is a chart of M2 growth, that's the green and Divisia and particularly in the great, uh, great recession, you see robust M2 growth. What's happening here is, at, but you see much weaker Divisi M3 and also during the, during the recovery. Remember the recovery was very long, right? And what's going on is the shadow system's falling apart. People are fleeing institutional money funds. Large time deposits are contracting. Banks are facing tougher capital requirements. They don't want to hold a lot. They don't want to have the asset growth that they had going in. And so a lot of the composition of, of Divisia M3 or M3 is shifting towards M2 and you're, you're ignoring that substitution. So I, I agree with you, Larry, that there's more work to be done. Um, and, uh, but I think that summarily just saying, you know, simple sum, Divisia, uh, simple sum aggregates have terrible velocity, therefore should we never look at money again? I think that's, that, uh, I think that we should re revisit this. The other thing I would also say is from a, from a predictive standpoint and a forecasting standpoint, how much history do we have with quantitative easing to really get a handle on how it affects long-term rates and the like? We only have, we have a very short history. It's very difficult to think about. What about these other things that are going on? We've had major changes in bank regulation that affect bankers' willingness to create liabilities in order to fund asset growth. We have had, um, and we've, we've had other things going on as well. And I think there's just some information here. It goes back to Poole's point a long time ago. But let's move on. Sorry. Yeah. Let, let me just make a point about QT, oh. QE. Very important what you mentioned. Uh, but QE wasn't about uh, quantitative easing. It was about duration. Okay. It wasn't because reserves went up so much. It was because of duration and term term premium being compressed. Just another view. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Barry Boss. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I had a, a bunch of comments and questions. I'll try to do them quickly. But you raised, you got me thinking about a lot of things from uh, Bordeaux's economic historian here. So I, first of all, I tend to think of all this in, as falling into three eras, the era of Reg Q and regulated rates, then deregulation. And then Bob, I think, appropriately mentioned the era of paying interest on reserves. And I think those are really regime shifts. And how you deal with those, I think, is important. And I'm not clear you've um, convinced me that you, when you look into long data, that you have a convincing story about that. Um, secondly, um, a lot of this is really a portfolio allocation issue, right? And as you're going through all this, you're showing this happened here, this happened here, it's people, are moving, time deposits are collapsing, and this is going here, et cetera. And certainly, you know, divisia aggregation which at least allows substitution uh, rather than fixed weights is I think fundamental. Um, I go back to Bob Hall making me understand that when he was teaching me Jorgensen and Grillicus's productivity studies and arguments with Ed Dennison uh, when he taught me econometrics. So, um, uh, so substitution is important and getting the right amount of substitution and whether a lot of these things are perfect substitutes or almost so is, as John Cochran is saying, that's something you ought to spend some more time thinking about. Um, and also whether you can get stable or useful real-time estimates for those uh, weights, I think is, an, is another issue. Um, and then you made all these predictions and they're all about nominal GDP. And then you kind of indicated, it seemed like you had some exogenous notion of supply in the background. But these events, at least in the short run, affected supply as well. And I'm just wondering how that fits into your story. Um, well, one thing we, 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 we did do is we estimated the model over the period of 
where, where deposits were deregulated, where mon money market mutual funds were, were allowed and made the transition, where money market deposit accounts, another you know, major uh, re uh, factor, most sa savings deposits really are money market deposit accounts, for example. So we estimated it over the the deregulated period. There are problems with divisia when you go to this period, this transition, because the transition you have artificially wide opportunity costs, and then you have people jumping to literally jumping to money market mutual funds, and the opportunity cost is a lot smaller. And if you just do a simple mechanical thing, you're going to say that money money is collapsing, right? It's kind of what you were talking about before. Um, we didn't make that mistake. And I think that that's something that uh, also something that one of the things that Barry, Mike and I are going to try to do is deal with that issue because Divisi is based on fundamentally is based on optimization behavior in the absence of constraints. Yeah. We take Absol that. Absolutely. Well, and solving differential equations. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the, the short version is, why did uh, money not go up during QE? The longer version is it's been very, in my thinking, it's been very influential that in the pandemic, um, there was a total amount of nominal assets that increased. Uh, the, the, this was, we printed money and we funded deficits with it. And so there's a wealth effect. Whereas mm -hmm. in QE, there's exactly the same amount of Fed buying stuff, but there was no big deficit. <laughs> and, so those to me look to me like the perfect test of monetarism, which is about the portfolio balance effect versus fiscal theory, which is about the overall quantity of, it's a wealth effect as opposed to a portfolio balance effect. So, and they seem exactly the same, 3 trillion bucks. We, the Fed buys 3 trillion bucks and give you 3 trillion <clears throat> reserves. In one case, nothing, no inflation. In the other case, inflation. But you're showing that uh, the QE did nothing for Divisia M3. Which, which is, so one, just mechanically, how is that? And two, if you think the Fed is controlling M3 and three trillion bucks of, of QE doesn't do anything, we how does the Fed? If it could no, no, we, 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 we influence it. Let me show you this chart here for the example. And this is something I think is important. The, uh, the, the solid regular black line is Divisia M3 growth. Okay? This heavy line here, is a loan, this is the charge off rate on uh, bank, bank loans, overall bank loans from the uh, Federal Reserve data. And so if bank loan losses are rising, uh, bankers are not willing to, to make as many loans when they're not able to also because of capital requirements. Um, this is one factor. And here, you know, bankers are protected. You've got the PPP loans, You've got all this fiscal support going on. The loan loss rate is as flat as a doornail. Um, and so they're more apt to, to take the big, big amounts of, you know, the big amounts of liquidity in the system and also expand upon what the Fed is doing. And you get stronger growth. The other thing to keep in mind is Dodd-Frank was proposed right around here and that's jacking up capital requirements big time and all sorts of restrictions. And that's also going to, and then we'll all, we had all, all other kinds of re re restraints on banks being proposed. And so in this period, you got, you don't get as much robustness here, at least in this period, we didn't have any change in bank regulations per se, other than that we did get rid of reserve requirements. But I would also say that bankers were much, much less willing to, um, were much more willing to lend and they didn't pull back as much. Um, and then we also, by the way, had another thing that's also going on in the background that a lot of people forget is we had ma major Federal, F Federal Reserve support with the backing of Treasury in the corporate bond market. Those spreads did not blow out to five and a half, six percent like they did over here. They stayed at around three. And so you didn't get the financial accelerator effects, a la Bernanke and such and company kicking in. You don't pick that, you know, you can't necessarily pick that up by looking at just uh, traditional indicators. There's some information going on in here. We're not getting that amplification that takes the economy down. 
Um, so I, that's why I think it's I think of it as an information variable, very endogenous. There are a lot of other partial programs going on in all these periods, right. some fiscal, some monetary. Right. For example, uh, while well, things were being clogged um, in the financial crisis, when they finally said they, uh, they finally had a commercial paper facility, it reopened overnight, basically. Right. Okay, so there's stuff like that that happens instantaneously um, and affects how you're aggregating these numbers. So, yeah. Um, but we want to get some fuller story than just we have to explain every episode with five special features and, and then. Right. So, yeah. Again, I get to what's the. Uh, if you if you can put this in and show some conditional value uh, in a with, with traditional macro stuff in it um, above and beyond what they're already able to do, that would be great. And I think that's where you're trying to head, yeah. but that's that's what would be valuable, I think. But, but this gets to John's question, John Cochran's question. I mean, because he's right. You know, when you have big fiscal expansions like wars and stuff, okay, the Fed accommodates. I'm work, that other paper I gave last year on the Bank of England, that, that's a very, a very compelling story. And that's when you see inflation. So in a sense, there, it, there was a difference between the, the GFC, what they did, and what they did, what they did recently. And I think that, and that is part of the story. They, it wasn't the federal government throwing all this money and depositing these checks in people's accounts. It's a, it's a different scene, I think. So, so I think it's, I think like when you get into these uh, races between the fiscal theory, the price level and a monetarist approach, you end up with this, the, the conclusion that they're observationally the equivalents. And I teach, I teach this stuff in my courses and you can tell a story that's consistent with him and also one that's consistent with them. So I, I, I think that there is something to that. Well, not quite. I mean, the open market operation, they take one thing and give you another, is qualitatively different from, I give you some more of both. U.S. Uh, fiscal deficits following 2008 were, as I recall, just as large a fraction of GDP as the deficits following COVID. Right. So I'm not sure that there's yeah. really a yeah. separation between fiscal and monetary in, in those two events. There actually is, but I don't want to get into really? it. Yeah. I, th I think it occurs a little bit. It's a, it's a little. I think I think when COVID, the, the deficits were a little bit bigger, a little more extended. But at the start, they were not that much different. Yeah. Yes. Your your next last point suggests impact of recent Fed tightening will be drawn out. I don't quite understand, sure. it, especially in the context of the chart. Sure. You just Absolutely. Had, had the funds rate a half percent through oh, most of last year. Excellent question. So. Uh, if we go back to the velocity chart, we're over here at the first quarter of, of, of 2023, right? So we're in a period where velocity is still going to go up. So if velocity is going up, well, well, money is going down or staying flat, you're still going to have some growth in aggregate demand. This is because they when forecast that the, uh, the restrictions are still easing. Yeah, and that people that are going back to normal and I, you know, I think more and more of the masks will come off and people will go back the to the cruise ships and all that. The model wasn't dynamic, except for velocity being a function of things that are disappearing. Right. Is that, right. So that's where the dynamics come Yeah. And so there, there is this, we still have further to go. Oops, this I gets back to Steve. Further. I don't get that. So the idea is that that velocity is still likely to rebound here. We're over here. We're going to probably go further up. And so until that, until we peak, until velocity stops going up, then there's going to be a delay in that slowing to really, it's, it's going to delay the full slowing of nominal GDP growth. And that's why we get this, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go forward. That's why we get some of this, some of this pattern, some of this, it takes a while to get back towards, at this line, we go back to 4% right around here. Three and a half, four percent. It's it's hand grenades and horseshoes. Uh, but but you had this picture yeah. where the funds rate was a half percent way on to twenty two. No, no, no. We're not we're not showing the funds rate. You just said you just had a chart. Oh no, that was uh, that was the past. Oh, that was the past. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, and this chart here, right? Yeah. And right this there. chart here, this was only through uh, funds rate. The funds rate is the dashed line. 
Yeah, but look, it's into 22, it's half a percent. No, no, this is the dash line. The dash line is the funds rate. Goes up to four. Goes up to four. The this the, the heavy line is the loan is the, is the loan loss rate. I'm right sorry, scale. wasn't very clear. Yeah, well, it says effective funds rate. Yeah, at the very uh, that's this one here. That's the dash line. I, I meant it to be there. I should have. So, I should have put that. I should have read that. We, we stay on the scratch a second. Sure. Because with Daryl's point in mind, yes. I'm just trying to. My point yeah. of RQ is just understanding mechanically why does Divisia do what it does, yeah. and so that would seem in the on the right hand side of this graph, the interest spread on deposits goes from Huge. nothing to four percent, and yet yeah. you're seeing Divisia M three collapse. I would have thought it would explode because now we count the exact same deposit as not. 10 basis points versus monetary services. No, it's going on if, if interest rates, if all well, if interest, if, if, if the funds rate rises and induces rises in interest rates then the benchmark rate is going to go up and then you're going to get some adjustment um, and people may switch out of, uh, may decide not to hold these high high opportunity cost assets. Remember- But we're not seeing a collapse in deposits. We're seeing a decline in Divisia M3, absolutely. But, but not not to make up for a 10 basis point to four percentage point money service. Oh, it's slowing. I mean, we're going from, I mean, look at the scales over here. We're going from, let's say 10% growth at the end of 2021. We're actually, if we extend this further out, this is year over year. <laughs> These are growth, John. These are growth okay, rates. Okay, it's, okay. it's 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 been You're minus four. The quantitative flow out of deposits is enough to overcome the higher interest spread that you're charging, that you're calling more money in the deposits. But also remember that that some some of those rates, the money fund rates, are are, are moving pretty darn close with the benchmark rate. Um, yeah. Large yeah. Time deposit rates are going to be moving up with it, but maybe not. So the spread is not moving up as much as might be indicated, might be thought. We got spreads and quantities moving. Yeah, I mean, so there's a there's a lot going on there. It's an aggregation. Oh, I see, I see your point. The spread is not. I finally understand Daryl's point. Of course, a growth of zero means nothing's happening. Right. Not too. No. It's just yeah. less. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. Sure. No. It's I yes, please. Yes. Yes. So. <clears throat> The, the great majority of economists at the Fed and, and academics as well subscribe to the New Keynesian view. Uh, the New Keynesian view gives very little weight. The, the basic three equation version does not have money in it uh, because the monetary policy uh, is completely summarized by the short term real rate. And the real rate story I think is pretty plausible as long as you the, the the chair of the Fed doesn't seem to understand that it's the real rate and not the nominal rate. But if you translate the what's happened in the last three or four years into real terms, uh, the the real rate plunged, uh, and at the time when the in, uh, when inflation went skyrocketed. And yeah. then as it's come down, we've had a huge increase in the real rate uh, over the past year right. uh, as the, 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 the instantaneous real rate uh, is basically down back down to 2%. Um, so, uh, so it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, the new Keynesian view can't be just dismissed. Uh, uh, it has, a, it has, a lot going for it. Um, now I'm, I, I'm not dismissing it. I, I, I view it as uh, what, what, we're, what I'm trying to say here is if we think about where the IS curve is, right? Yes. And the one of the issues with the New Keynesian approach is you have to know what the Vixellian neutral real rate is, which has been moving all over the place. You've got to deal with long rates as well. Okay. And where the position of the IS curve is, you, you're, you're making guesses during a pandemic, right? And what I, I kind of view this is if you're in a pandemic or you're in a crisis, 
and you're going to have some unusual effects. You may need to have some sort of contained discretion approach, uh, a la Michigan Bernanke, uh, but you, you want to get as much information as you can. And in a Poolian world where you're having IS shocks, if you can control for the velocity of a monetary aggregate, you can get some information from it. And, and that's, that's where we're coming from. I mean, think about the problems we had in the Great Recession. We had a tremendous, we had a tremendous shock to the financial stability and the financial resilience. And we had big hits to household wealth. We had a whole slew of things hitting. And the economy and the recovery were weaker than we had thought it would be. And yet when we had the COVID recession, if we go back to the spring of 2020 and we look at some of those projections, I mean, folks, let's face it. We were, we were, we, we thought, you know, a lot of people thought we were looking down the barrel of the great depression. Okay. We were, you know, when is this thing going to end and all that? Well, to some extent um, you get the, you get the vaccines, spending comes back, people start drawing down their excess excess savings or you know spending their excess money balances however you want to interpret it um you're going to see some uh, uh, some recovery in um an, an aggregate demand and so that's why i emphasize this as an information variable uh, it can it can be useful i i don't think that I mean, if you go back to bruner and Meltzer, there are shocks to both the the liability side and the and, and the asset side of the bank balance sheet, and they both matter, okay? And whereas Woodford and co company took a very, rather strong view. Sure. Took, he took interest out of the title of Don Patikin's big book. Absolutely, yes, and I, I congratulate him for it. Yeah. Well, I think I, I don't, I'm not, I'm, not I'm, I'm actually more on the credit side of things, uh, but but I think that there's still some information there. So Mickey, yeah. Mickey has a question, Mickey. Yes. Thank you, maybe. Yes, um, just your going back to post financial crisis. I mean, I think I, I agree with you about the information in the variable because there was, you know, through the Fed's QE one, two, and three, you had this huge increase in reserves and base money, but no decided acceleration in either Divisia or M two. But then if you look at the broader context there, the, the banking system was crippled and had no capital. They were facing stress tests and the, and the uh, supervisors bearing down on them. They were not making loans. So bank lending was falling. And at the same time, you know, housing was crippled and so were bank, so were consumer balance sheets and so, and so the money was the, the the base money was not put to work if you can compare that to post financial uh, to the to the post um um covid era, you know the, the the banking system was very well capitalized household balance sheets were were flush um and it was much more similar to the post World War II era, where where there was just this surge of spending and and velocity, following um, you know following World War II, and so I, I kind of like what you say about the information in 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 this, and I, I would I would just add a a final point. Um, wait till you see. Um, Third quarter nominal GDP, you're going to see a surge quarterly in in um, in both your Divisia and your M2 velocity, and and it looks like the the lags are working, and there is important information in in your monetary approach. I think that uh, well, we we sort of agree with you, Mickey. Uh, uh, maybe uh, yeah. But I, I wanted to say something. I wanted to get back to what Bob Hall said. So one of the things we're thinking of doing is translating this into interest rate space. I was thinking of okay. like we, was... we look at the Taylor rule and then we can translate the the you know the divisia into 
where are we relative to a Taylor rule? And I think there's a way you can do that. Just the way that, you know, people during the, like during the, during the uh, zero lower bound period, people were estimating sort of, you know, pseudo or, you know, um, I guess that's the right word, Taylor rules. And they were showing that the gaps were, you know, were, were pretty large in that period when interest rates were frozen. So I was thinking we could trans, if we could translate this into that language, that could then be able to be explained to people who forgot about M and V and all that. Woodford has been accused of a major crime, but I think I think what he did was was genius, um, and it's really it's really it's what our graduate students are taught. You know. Well, that well, and there's that, a reason that, because the Fed does not control the quantity of money. So if the Fed does not control the quantity of money, MV equals PY may work wonderfully. It describes the demand for elastically provided money, uh, every time which is very interesting. And you know, as as I, I buy ball bearings or inventory, I buy Cheetos. We have an inventory of Cheetos in the house, and as you know, nominal GDP goes up, we hold more nominal Cheetos in the house. But that doesn't mean you control GDP by controlling Cheetos, right? Whereas, Unless the Fed controls the, the quantity. Whereas the, the, Fed, the Fed's control of the interest rate is absolute. The monetary directions specify. Well, that's the way they're going now. They, they could try yeah, to control the quantity. Yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, I have another question. Uh -huh. Is we, we have gross domestic income as well as gross domestic product. <laughs> and when you're talking about uh, the kinds of things you're talking about, it seems like the income side. And, and of course, recently there's been a huge diversion, huge uh, uh, statistical discrepancy uh, in which income hasn't risen nearly as much as, as output. Right, and that would suggest that there, there well, yeah, that would, that, would, that would have a different path. Um, yeah, significantly different path, yeah. a worryingly large. Yeah. But, Bob, didn't this get traced down to the accounting of the Fed's um, remittances to the Treasury? I'm sort of vaguely remembering Jason Furman explaining this, and you, if anybody would know. So, well, that says that nobody knows. <laughs> you guys uh, want to conclude, or what do you? Yeah, no. yeah. We, Any we other do. Questions? We're fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.